Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Edward from the Inland Empire Regional Chamber of Commerce. Happy to have you here as our live audience. Uh, we're going to be creating a series of webinars with content um, to help small business owners and young professionals and actually anyone for that matter. And so we're going to publish these to the web um, in our library of content on the website soon. Uh, so we gave folks the option to tune in live if they want to hear a live demonstration and 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 uh, hear the program firsthand. Uh, so I thank you for being here. We're going to get started. Today's uh, webinar is the fine art of credit management, which you know we should all uh, know about. Uh, we could all probably learn more about this topic here. I know I can. But uh, with that being said, uh, thank you for being here again, and I want to introduce the Chamber's Director of Education, Mr. Eddie Sumar. Thank you very much, Mr. Ornelas. Uh, and uh, this is the third in the series of the Building Back Better series uh, that we are doing in conjunction with the County of San Bernardino Economic Development, the Otis Academy, and the Inland Impa Regional Chamber of Commerce. So thank you very much, Edward, when we thank the county for giving us that opportunity to be of uh, value as a chamber to the small business community, but as Edward mentioned, to anyone in the business community, whether we are a Fortune 100 companies or we are sole owners, we need to understand the importance of credit management. But notice in the title, I added two words, fine art, because credit management is not a science. It's not one plus one equals two. Why? Because economic conditions change. If we approve credit for a person today in good economic conditions and they pay, it doesn't mean they will continue to pay on time when the economic conditions worsen. Today, a company could be small. Tomorrow, it could be big. You deny a small company a credit line, tomorrow, they could become a unicorn, a Fortune 100 company. So in essence, it's an art, the art of managing risk. So today I'm going to be sharing with you what I learned over 40 plus years in credit management and, and collection management. In fact, tomorrow we're going to have a dedicated uh, uh, session on getting paid. But today we're going to go to the origin of debt, the extension of credit. So we'll be talking about the fundamentals of credit to increase sales and profitability. Because when we look at the income statement, the top line in any income statement, whether for a sole ownership or a Fortune 100 or 500 companies, it starts with the top line of sales revenue. Just imagine if a company decided only to sell on cash. Its market share is going to be smaller than if they decided to sell on cash and extending credit and trade financing options. So in essence, what we are going to be talking about today, a fundamental checklist for the success of every credit professional. Again, if you are a sole owner, it doesn't mean that you have to have a credit department, but you have to understand credit and credit management and act as a credit professional in your extension of credit. Many times, small businesses think that they are selling on cash. For example, here, here is a scenario. A customer comes buys from you on cash and you deliver uh, the merchandise or the service. Two weeks later, they come back and said, oh, can you give me the product? I'll pay you here with a check. And lo and behold, that check bounces. It's no longer a cash transaction. It's credit transaction. Or a customer buys from you and said, guess what? Can you give me five days? A lot of small companies mistaken that for cash transaction. It is not. The moment a customer or a client takes a, uh, the product out of our possession or we deliver the service and we haven't gotten paid either before or with the extension of service or when we transfer the title of that product to the customer, we have extended credit. Now we are no longer in possession of the product or of the service. In essence, what happens? We are at the mercy of the customer paying us for that service or that product. So today I want to equip you with the techniques and the tools and the mindset that anytime we sell, yes, you can sell on credit be, and be able to go to sleep knowing that that customer is going to pay you. So we are going to work together to construct a checklist to gather the ingredients in order to be able to extend credit with minimum risk if possible. 
many times people think you come to my store, you come to my establishment, I sell you the product and you are going to pay me. In fact, the journey of cash flow begins not with the, with the extension of credit or with, with the, pa the passage of title of that product or the exchange of hand. It starts with sales and marketing. Because when we think of sales and marketing, before a customer came to your store or to engage your services, they had a need. But they didn't know about you, that you existed as a company or as provider of service. But then they hear about you. Now, through your sales and marketing efforts, you are building the prospect's desire and willingness to buy your company's products or services. Now, once that desire is really uh, 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 mature, they come to you and say, wow, now I need it. I need to buy from you, but I don't have the cash. That's when we put on the credit due diligence role. That means here, whether we are sole owners or a small company, medium-sized company, whether we have a credit department or not, someone in that company, whether the owner, the CEO of the company, the general manager or the credit manager or the credit analyst, someone has to determine the customer's or the prospect's willingness to pay you and ability to pay you. You still haven't gotten paid that you just decided, yes, I'm going to do business with this particular prospect, that therefore you are converting that prospect into a customer or a client. But does it mean that the client is going to pay you immediately? If it was cash, great. But what if you extended credit? At this moment, customer service comes into play. When we extend service, we continue to service the client and fulfill their needs and delight them with our service. Now we are protecting and preserving and maintaining the willingness and the ability to pay us. Because most, most companies have other vendors. So really the one that they feel more attracted to, more related to, they're going to pay them first, especially when economic condition worsen, companies are going to be loyal to those that show them humanity, those that they have relationship with. A good case, when Argentina collapsed, for example, economically, first Brazil in 1997, I had to fly down to Brazil when I worked for Rainbird and believe it or not, because I built strong relationship with my distributors, I got paid every dime out of, uh, of uh, Brazil when the devaluation of Riage. Then Argentina fell. We went down to Argentina because of the relationship we collected every dime. Huh, extending service, building relationship help us to collect. The last hat we put on is collection efforts, which means helps convert willingness and ability to actual cash in the bank. And that's why understanding credit, understanding how to deploy the tools of credit will increase the top line, which is sales revenue, and will also beef up the bottom line through our due diligence, through our customer service and collection efforts. We convert profit into actual cash. So in reality, in today's session, we are going to concentrate on credit due diligence. Notice the, uh, the word diligence. That means we cannot be complacent. We cannot be careless in, in the extension of credit. We need to understand inside out who is the customer that we are working with or dealing with. What is their ability to pay? And some people, you'd be surprised. You could be dealing with millionaires or billionaires. It doesn't mean that they're going to pay on time. Having money doesn't mean they're going to give you that money. It's their willingness that I look for. Because when you combine willingness and ability, that builds a strong character. So we're going to start by defining the word credit. In fact, credit comes from the Latin word credere, which means to trust. It is a mutual trust between the grantor and the recipient of the credit. It involves a great deal of trust and confidence, notice this, in the ability, willingness, and character of a debtor to deliver on its promises to the creditor according to agreed upon terms. Credit also implies a reciprocal trust that the creditor will deliver what was contracted or agreed upon. Thus, credit is a cooperative function between seller and buyer or between the creditor and the debtor. So that's exactly what we see here, that when we think of the word credit, there is a great deal of trust. When someone comes to you, they want to buy your product or service, the first question you ask, can I trust 
the my customer to pay me on time but also the customer is going to say can i trust the company and its product and services if something goes wrong with that product or services will they stand behind it do they have the warranties do they have the service that they can fix that issue immediately that's why a lot of people love to buy from costco because no question asked anything goes wrong you take the product back to costco but costco has an agreement with all its vendors like when i worked for rainbird corporation we used to give Costco an immediate 3% credit on all the volume of sale for possible returns. So Costco doesn't have to send Rainbird say, I had X amount of sprinklers sold, so many, uh, a percentage got returned. We said, don't worry, give the uh, uh, refund your customer, don't make any hassle. And then we deal behind the scene on that. So that's very important. So in essence, it's a mutual trust, both creditor and debtors, clients, customers and the provider service of the product should trust one another. Now, in credit is an amazing tool because it's a chameleon. It could be used in different format. Many times when you think of credit, it's a sales tool. Like, as we said before, you want to increase the top line instead of just selling on cash, use credit. Now credit becomes a sales tool to increase sales revenue, but also Credit is a marketing tool. Just imagine, because sales is a subfunction of marketing. So as companies market their services and their products, they add a line that financing will be available. Credit could be extended. That really attracts more people to come to look at the product or service. Imagine if people uh, wanted cars, but they couldn't find financing on cars or houses, then the sale of houses and cars will not be as heavy as we see it today because the extension of credit allows people to buy now and pay later. And credit really is a financing vehicle. It's really buying car, that credit becomes a finance tool. Buying a house, it's a finance tool. Companies buy airplanes, for example, airlines, they use finance as a tool to acquire the airplane today and to pay the debt over decades. And then credit allows us with, uh, to create strategic alliances with sales and marketing with the customer to increase our sales and our profitability. But many times companies don't realize that to extend credit doesn't start with the functional department, the, the, the credit department, or if you are a sole owner with the CEO or the company deciding, okay, I want to sell more. I'm going to start extending credit. It really starts by knowing the company's vision and the company's goals. Because really, if the, if, the, if the vision of the company is to grow the company conservatively, then the strategy of credit and the philosophy of credit will be different than if the company wanted to grow uh, in a more liberal way. So the vision and the goals of the company come into play. Now, what do we mean by company vision? We mean the overall vision and goals, the department vision and goals, and even though a company might be small, might not have a credit department. They need to have a mindset that the moment they extend the credit, create the mindset that now you are the credit professional. Credit and sales now working together. And in a sole owner, the, the owner is the salesperson and is the credit person, is the CEO of the company. But as the companies grow, now one person does the sale, another person is going to do the credit for check and balance. Credit is a sales and marketing tool. Credit department becomes a center for client services. So that's why as companies grow, you, you see functional approach to credit. I work for companies who have credit departments. And in fact, the Rainbird Corporation, we had a credit department in Europe. We had a credit department in, in Glendora, California. And then we had extensions of that in Mexico, in Dubai, in Egypt, Australia, etc. So in essence, as companies grow, the credit function is going to grow. The second thing that we need to understand when, when we are dealing with also um, uh, extension of credit is the mission of the company. Because your mission as a company, no matter what size, is going to dictate the strategy and the philosophy of extending credit. Which means when I think of a mission of a company, I have to think of the purpose, the reason for the company's existence, the strategies that the company is really pursuing, the ways of doing things. These are the behaviors and the standards that the companies embody and they really adopt 
and they need to also adapt. That's why when we think of credit, many companies believe that credit is really static policy. In reality, look at this pandemic from 2020. A lot of companies have to change their credit policies. Go back to 2008, 2009, th during uh, the, 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 the economic and financial collapse. Companies had to change uh, the, uh, their policies. In 1997, when the uh, 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 devaluated, or the tequila crisis, 1994-95, or the tango crisis in Argentina in 2001, all these required the whole world to fine tune and reshape their credit policies. So the mission has changed because the landscape has changed. The economic landscape has changed. And also the values of the company are going to dictate what type of credit we are going to extend. The second, the, the next thing that we need to understand as we form a credit policy is understand the company culture. Now, if a company is sales oriented, that is going to be really a, a great thing for the top line, but it could also be a hindrance to the bottom line. Because I've seen companies, they concentrate on sales, but they don't understand that you cannot just sell anything without due diligence and without ability and willingness to pay. But the company wanted sales. So if you really want to sell, you can sell. But the art really is how can I convert the sale in actual cash in the bank? So we need to understand the culture of the company. A sales-oriented culture will, will function one way. A conservative culture is another way. A customer-centric culture is another way. So the extension of credit is going also to link to the company culture. That's why we have conservative cultures, liberal, profit-oriented. Imagine if a company is profit-oriented, they are not going to be selling any transaction unless there is a profit margin in every deal. A case in point, I know of a company that they will not sell a deal until there is a minimum 35% margin in every, uh, in every transaction. Sometimes if you are selling internationally, you might have a 70% margin in one, but maybe 20% margin. That company really accepted everything above 35 and denied everything below 35. It's because they are profit oriented and they have specific markups and profit or uh, uh, profit that they wanted to generate. Other companies say, no, I want to look at the overall profit, not the profit per transaction. Then they say, I can take a hit in one, I can make money in another. When I combine the two, my average is higher than that 35. So sales and marketing oriented companies. So if we look at the culture, is going to dictate to the credit professional what type of credit philosophy and policy and strategy to pursue. The next thing we need to understand is it's not just about saying, I want to extend credit. We need to create a structure because today we are living in a, in a time of compliance. Take, for example, this war on Ukraine. It has changed a lot of the banking rules and regulations. In fact, I received an email today about five top banks in China said that China is going to be really the banking system is going to take a hit. There are, even though some of the banks in China made profits more than expected, but now they are predicting that to the what is happening right now, there are there is going to be a shakeup due to the pandemic, the uh, the uh, real estate market that happened in China and and the war situation right now uh, in Europe. So things change. So now they have to look, even one bank says they used to give more loans to the agri, uh, agri business, to the agricultural sector in China. Now they are tightening that. Ah, they tighten their credit policies because of the economic and the geopolitical uh, uh, landscape happening, not only in China, but around the world. Which means when we extend credit to create consistency and predictability, we need to construct policies and procedures. Now, when I talk about policies and procedures, I, I don't kid you. I helped a company to build a policies and procedure book. One company had 50, another 75, another 2,000 pages. So your policies and procedures are going to depend on you as an individual, as a department, and as a company. Rainbird, we had only seven pages of major strategy for credit policy. But then when I created the, the memorandum for every policy, we had hundreds of pages added to those seven pages. But one thing is very important for any company, small or large, when we want to think of credit and collection policies, we need to, to first have a section in that manual about the vision and mission. 
We need to reflect the culture, encode the standards of behaviors, and reflect the values. Then it has to be all encompassing. When we think of a credit policy, we need to think of a new customer policy. Then credit investigation policy. How do I acquire an onboard? Credit analysis. That means now when I craft a credit application, how many pages? Could it be an express one page? Could it be a standard three pages or more detailed with financial analysis, five to 10 pages? It depends on, on the, the depth and breadth of the line of credit. If it's less than $10,000, why do the express? 50,000, 10,000, we do the standard. Above 50,000, now we need not only credit analysis, but financial analysis. We have to go through the authority level policies, credit limit policies, then credit terms policy, credit hold, what happens when a customer uh, doesn't pay on time? You gave them 30 days or 15 days or 45 days. When do you put the customer on hold? One day past due or you keep selling until there are 15 day past due? It depends on the company. My recommendation, one day past due. They have to pay according to terms and condition. You don't extend any more credit until they, uh, they pay uh, 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 the terms then you can liberate the line. As they, they pay, you can sell based on your gut feeling. Are they going to go bankrupt? Are they going into insolvency? Are they facing financial uh, uh, difficulties or is just a hiccup in their system? They didn't get paid from a big company. Once their client pays, they'll pay all the other vendors. Then you look at periodic credit review policies. Right there, that alone could be one or two, several pages in a, in a policy book collection policy. Notice I combine credit collection together because that's the currency uh, of a company of sales and marketing. They work together. Sales is one part of the coin. Credit collection is the other side of the coin, converting the deal into cash in the bank, which means with credit comes the understanding of cash application policy, dispute resolution policy, third party for a policy, bad debt and write-offs, record keeping and disclosure policy. Even though this part goes more in the collection policy, I like always the credit professional or the business owner to think of these issues at the credit extension point, then they do not have any blinders. Then we need to chart the process. Just imagine if you look at all the policies, now each policy has to have a process. Let me share with you how we onboard a new client. Like one company will have a setup sheet, which means the sales force, the marketing team will, will send a write up on that company to set them in the system. They haven't yet been approved, but we set them up in the system to expedite the process of credit approval. Then the customer fills out a credit application. They send it to the credit department. The credit department will get credit reports depending on the line, whether one or two or three different uh, credit reports, whether it's experience done on Bradstreet, Street, Equifax, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then the application will have trade references. Then they will have bank references. If it's above a certain limit, 20,000 or more, I might ask financial statements. Above 100,000, I want audited financial statement. What do we do with this financial statements? We do credit scoring. We do financial ratio analysis. We do Z scoring to predict the, uh, uh, the bankruptcy uh, probability of that company. And then always I include in any credit extension, my sales force comments. If I'm the owner, my own comment, because I'm the owner, I'm the salesperson, I'm the credit person at the same time. I'm going to be the collector. Then I have to, to annotate my point of view. Why do I need this deal? Why do I need to sell this company, this amount at this credit uh, or on cash? Next, we need to think of security instruments. If I want to protect the company, in international business, we use a, 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 a tool called letters of credit. But there are different kinds. There are standard uh, uh, letter of credit, ICLCs, that are irrevocable commercial letters of credit or standby letter of credit. Then there are company guarantees. Then there are promissory notes or pagares in Mexico in the Latin world. There are security agreements, UCC filing, liens. Then there, are, there is credit insurance. Like many times when I worked for a company doing credit, I always have a credit insurance policy to protect my receivables. And then there's trade financing alternatives. 
because I dealt with transaction where a company will come from Latin America or from any part of the world saying, Eddie, I want to buy this irrigation equipment from Rainbird, but I cannot uh, afford to pay a million dollars in six months. Can you give me three years? Can you give me five years? At that moment, we invoke trade financing alternatives, which means we can give the company anywhere from one year to possible seven years with four fay uh, techniques. And that's a more advanced for credit and trade finance people. Here is a charting the process of a collection and write off process. For example, we'll talk more about it tomorrow, but here, as you're writing your credit policy, think of the other side of the coin, the collection policy. Are you going to be calling your, your, uh, your clients when they are past due or before past due? Are you emailing them, sending letters and backing up? Involve your sales force. Some companies uh, uh, don't like to involve their sales force, but in my opinion, a sales force is a great collection tool because they can do collection in a different uh, a way. They have the procurement manager that are friends. They know people there that the credit department might not be working with. In this case, they are going to create leverage to get us paid. Initiate payment plans, for example. Involve in-house legal departments. Some companies have attorneys and, and the credit professional forgets to involve their in-house attorney in the collection process. I did that many times and we got paid immediately. Refer to collection, to outside collection and outside legal. Then put an account on bad debt list and then you write off an account. So in essence, this is the process of a systematic approach to not only credit due diligence, but excelling in your collection efforts. Another key component that a lot of credit professionals and business owners overlook is compliance. Compliance means we need to understand the legal environment of, of business. Now, if we are dealing in credit, this is some of the acts that we need to understand. Every credit professional, every business owner should understand the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the Truth in Lending Act, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, they call it ECOA, Antitrust Regulations, the Sherman Act of 1890, the Clayton Act of 1914, the Robinson Patman Act of 1936, FTC Act of 1914. All these acts come to bear on understanding the credit landscape and the collection landscape. Bankruptcy Act, Money Laundry Act, the Patriot Act, Export Administration Regulations when we are selling internationally, Customs Regulations. This is just the tip of the iceberg, what a credit professional should understand and should be involved in, at least at the level of having the knowledge. We might not become attorneys uh, uh, and understand the rules and regulations uh, of the United States Congress, but we need to know that they exist. And when we need help, we contact the attorneys that are really experts in this area, or we contact the agencies. We Google those agencies, we Google those acts. We try to, to understand and decipher the spirit of the act and then when we need help, we involve the experts to help us in the tactical approach. Now, also, when we think of credit, we, I love matrices. And I want to share with you two important tools in credit management. Any person, any business, if we can master those tools, I can assure you, you are going to be able to sell more, increase the top line, which is sales revenue by selling on credit, and increase your profitability. And when you look at your balance sheet, because when we sell on credit, we create accounts receivables, I can guarantee you that quality of the receivable is going to be very, very high. So should you need to collateralize the accounts receivable, go to the bank and get a loan against those receivables, the bank is going to look at the quality of that portfolio and decide, wow, this is worthy. I can lend you money against that portfolio. It becomes like asset-based lending. You have an asset called accounts receivable, I'm going to be able to lend you because I know the high quality of your customers. They have the ability and willingness to pay you the top notch. Therefore, you get a better percentage and a better loan value. So now let's look at the matrix. This matrix, we can use it in different ways. It could be a sales matrix. It could be a credit matrix. It could be a collection matrix. It also be, it could be a negotiation matrix. Because look at the quadrants. If a prospect uh, presents themselves, your sales and marketing person comes to you and said, Eddie, I want you to approve this client. If I look at this prospect and say, yes, they are willing to pay me and they're able, I say to the salesperson, green light, pursue. If the person is able to pay me, a big company, 
but they are not willing at this moment. They don't have the desire. I need to build that desire. Or guess what? I'll buy credit insurance on that company, and then I will approve it. What if it's, they are willing, but they are unable? That means those people are great, but they don't have the money right now to buy a system. Then maybe I find enhancers and enablers for that deal. What about if they are neither uh, able nor willing? Abandon that prospect. See how beautiful? Any prospect, they go into one of four quadrants. Abandon or find the enhancers or work on willingness and insurance or pursue without any, uh, any fear. Credit focus, the same thing. We used it for sales. Now, when it comes, willing, able, I approve the deal. So if my salesperson says, I want to go after a company that's able and willing, said, you get me the application, I'll approve it. But a person uh, or a company that is able but unwilling, I'll work now to protect the transaction. We find maybe guarantees, co-signers, something that can, uh, that can happen. A good example, if you have a child who's, uh, who's 15, 16 year old, and the child needs a car, Maybe you say, okay, I want to buy a car for my son, but the son cannot sign a contract, but the parents can. The parents have great FICO score, have great credit, they have a good job. I might be able to say, okay, let's put it in the name of the son to start building their credit, even though they are in the age of the minority, because in a few years, they'll be in the age of the majority. The parents will go sign this and guarantee it. I'll approve the deal. So there are many, many ways of doing things, because you want a legal person to sign the contract, but you want to build the credit standing of someone else that doesn't have uh, the credit standing. Willing, unable, think outside the box, seek alternatives. Unable, unwilling, reject this applicant. Let's make a collection focus here. Able, and willing, great, they'll pay you on time. If they're able, unwilling, I'll pursue vigorously and I will send them the collection or to attorneys, third party involvement. Willing, unable, I will work with the customer. I'll put them on a payment plan and we'll talk more about it tomorrow in the next uh, uh, webinar. But those who are unable to pay you, unwilling to pay you, there is only one way. Write them off, cancel the deal, don't waste your time. They are bankrupt or insolvent. You are not going to get anything. Just how beautiful this tool, really, it helps you as a business owner to understand, to classify, categorize your prospects and your customers in order to guarantee that what you sold on credit is going to be collected in cash, cash in the bank. Because there is a, an adage, a sale is not a sale until the cash is in the bank. Now, another tool that I use as a credit professional, like when I do credit analysis, like imagine if, if you are a small business owner and you want to qualify with vendors, start thinking also from this uh, perspective, build a strong character so the vendors can give you good lines, and good uh, uh, terms and conditions on, on whatever products you are buying from your vendor. The same thing, now look at your customer. I need a customer of great moral character. That means when things get tough, that customer is going to pay you no matter how long it takes. So I look at the sea of character before I approve a, a credit transaction. I look at the capacity. That means I call that the income statement uh, uh, assessment. That means do they have the capacity to generate sales? Do they have salespeople, marketing people? Do they have the ability not only to manufacture for the sale, but also to manage their operations in a profitable way? Then I look at capital. That means I look at their balance sheet. I look at their assets. I look at their liabilities. Then I look at their, uh, at their net worth. Does the company has a net worth? Because believe it or not, Dun & Bradstreet will tell me a credit line should not exceed 10 to 15% of the tangible net worth of a company. Exim Bank will come and say, I can approve if the, 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 uh, the tangible net worth does not exceed, uh, I cannot exceed more than 40%. So just imagine if a company has a net worth of a million dollars, Exim Bank says, I'm comfortable for four, with $400,000. Dun & Bradstreet says, I'm comfortable with 150000 But then with multiplier effects, we can move that 150000 to maybe 300000 Now, what I do, I'll take 400000 and 300000 and 150000 add them and divide them by three. Now, I can get maybe around 200000 to 180000 300000 So I'll go in between. And as they start paying on time, that line starts to increase. 
So these are the C's of credit approval. We start with character, capacity, capital. Now we go into number four, collateral and guarantees. Imagine a prospect that has good uh, willingness and ability. They have the capacity and the capital and the character. It stands the reason they have the collaterals and the guarantees. Then I look at the C at conditions. I look at the conditions of the business, the economy, the industry, the politics. Take, for example, the war in Ukraine. For instance, before people could do business with Russian entities, now it's going to be very difficult because a lot of entities have been sanctioned, which means the conditions of the economy, the conditions of the world precludes me as a U.S. company to be doing business now with a, a Russian company. And if I had to do business, I might have to go to the State Department, the Department of Commerce, the Bureau of Industry and Security to get a special waiver and dispensations in order to be able to, uh, to do business with a Russian entity. Number six, I look at computers. That means the technological state. I look at the prospect. Are they living in the Stone Age or are they able to use technology in the 21st century to keep on going and to be relevant in this economic uh, situation. Number seven is common sense. Every credit professional is going to say, I, in my gut, I feel this is going to be a bad deal. Common sense says, then don't issue the credit. But if you say, I know that they don't have good uh, credit on paper right now, but I know the owners, I know their family, they have been great, there are pillars in the community, I'm willing to take the risk. If your gut feeling says take a risk, Take a risk, but take a calculated risk. How? With credit insurance, if you can. So C, we call that coverage. The C of coverage of credit insurance will allow you to sell to more people than if you didn't have that credit insurance policy. Now, in credit, also we have what we call the interpersonal Cs. Remember, it's the fine art of credit management. We deal with people. That means there's going to be a great deal of communication, two-way communication. When I ask the, uh, the client, like sales and marketing will tell the prospect, go fill out an application. The application will be sent to the credit department. The credit department has questions. I have to contact the client. There will be communication between me, sales and marketing, and the prospect. It has to be two-way open and honest communication. Cooperation and collaboration has to come into play and courtesy. Like if I tell a client and said, Mr. Prospect, I would love three year financial statement. If they tell me take a hike, I'll say, okay, sir, they didn't show me courtesy. I cannot approve. But if they work with me, with my request, with, uh, in a courteous manner, I will be able to continue the credit approval process. The next phase are the, the negative C's of credit approval, which means carelessness, complacency, and competition. Meaning, if I am a business owner, if I'm a credit professional and a salesperson or process, Guess what? I want to buy your product, but your competition is doing this. I never follow the competition. I study the competition, but I'm the leader in selling my product or service. I'm not going to be dictated upon by the competition because that's a negative C. Sometimes the competition will build minefields for you to fall into them so it will blow in your face and they get you out of the business. Complacency. That means some salespeople say, Eddie, don't worry. These people, yes. They bought, you approved a hundred thousand dollars. Now they want another hundred thousand. I know that they didn't pay on time, but they will pay. I cannot be complacent. Or they can say, look, wonderful. This company is Eastman Kodak. It was wonderful when it was in, in its heyday and Wonder Bread. Where is Eastman Kodak today? Where is Wonder Bread today? They went bankrupt. So I cannot be complacent. A company that pays on time today doesn't mean they will continue to pay on time. Credit due diligence and credit vigilance is ongoing and carelessness. Imagine salespeople say, just Eddie, approve it. But guess what? They didn't sign the application. They'll sign it later. Oh, the guarantee was inside. They'll sign it later. No, T's have to be uh, uh, crossed. I's have to be dotted. I cannot approve. I cannot be careless. It has to be fully and completely done before I approve it. The positive C's. Every time a credit professional shows care, concern, and compassion towards sales, towards marketing, because the, they brought us the deal, and towards the prospect or the, customer, the existing customer who wants an increase in credit line or increase in, in terms. If we show concern and compassion and care, we can make things happen. So, so far, these are the basic 18 Cs of domestic transaction. 
But should you decide to go international, we infuse three more Cs, country risk, currency control, FX risk, and cultural differences. That's cultural risk. These are very important. When I look at country, I look at the, the best analysis, the political, economic, sociocultural, technological state of every country. Currency control, look what happened to the rubles with the war of Ukraine and with the sanction. Boom, it hit bottom. So it, de it devastated a lot of fortunes. The same thing international trade. In 1997, when the Raj devaluated, the, the Raj was uh, like 119 to the dollar, overnight became 239 to the dollar. If somebody owed you $100,000, now it becomes the equivalent of $200,000. Wow. It became very, very difficult for Brazilians to pay their debt on time. That's why we had to extend their terms from 30, 60 days, 90 days to almost a year to a year and a half before the Brazilian distributors pay their debt. Cultural differences, how we collect from one country to another, how we, we approve credit from one country to another is subject to cultural differences and to cultural nuances and protocols. See how amazing now we come up with 21 C's of credit when we, we deal with international. But also here there is C Isaac, I say. C means creativity. Anytime we deal with credit and credit approvals, we have to be creative. I, innovation. We have to think of innovative ways to extend credit in order to sell more, to be profitable, convert receivable into cash. We live in the, in the digital age. People have uh, today want an answer now. Before a person will send us a credit application, it could take three to four weeks to get a done on Prestige War report on them, a credit report. Then all of a sudden, a month to three months have passed before a credit approval. Now people want it to approve immediately. So speed has to be taken into consideration. Agility. Think about it. You're approving a company in Ukraine and boom, war on Ukraine. Now what happens? You can't be selling now that company in Ukraine because maybe their establishment got bombed by the Russians. <laughs> they lost their inventory. Banks are being affected now. What if uh, uh, you are selling to a Russian tycoon and now all his money and oligarch has been frozen? All of a sudden, companies have to be agile. I read a report about Chase, uh, uh, JP Morgan Chase, that the Russian government owed them bonds. Like they already made a $102 million payment on a bond. Because the Russian government said, okay, I will continue paying these international bonds. But they say in the next few days, there's going to be over a billion dollars. Now they're watching that because they pay the first hundred million, they pay the other hundred and two million. What is going to happen with the billion dollar that is going to come due in a few days? This could collapse a, a system if, if a bank or a country defaults on something that their own credit standing and rating becomes junk, and that affects the business community in that country. So that's why agility is important. We have to think speedily, be agile to move with every situation that is happening around the world. Accuracy. When we think of credit due diligence and financial analysis, it's a combination of a science and an art. There is a science to, to really come up with the, with the formulas, and the numbers, but there is the art of interpreting those numbers. So we need accuracy in the numbers first. Imagine if I'm looking at a financial statement that is totally inaccurate. I cannot come up with a credit line uh, for that company because the numbers are not truthful. That's why we ask sometimes for audited financials to make sure that someone have, has audited that financial. Now I can, as a credit professional, feel, yeah, now the numbers are more accurate. But it doesn't mean that because there are many assumptions in accounting and there's a lot of window dressing. That's why there's an expression, gap versus gap, which is generally accepted accounting principles versus games accountants play. So in essence, even when I'm looking at financial statements, I need to look at the reputation of the CPA firm, the accountants who generated those financials and those audits. If they're honorable, then it's great. But even before we had the big eight and the big five and the big fours, even some of them, Ernest and Young and others, they got really sanctioned by, by governmental entities because they were playing games. Even the big firms, some of them play games. And ultimately, see of courtesy. So these are the hallmark of a good credit professional. We need to be creative, innovative, speedy, agile, 
accuracy and always be courteous despite of what the customer or the sales and marketing team will tell us. Usually I like to put quotes in my presentation. I love to say the words of Sir Winston Churchill, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. So if you think about it, credit is the lifeblood of, of the economy. Just think about it. If people in America cannot get credit lines, they will not have homes that easily. They cannot afford cars that easily because who has cash? Maybe the Chinese and others that have a mindset of uh, saving, they can go and pay cash uh, and whatever. But most Americans, most people around the world do not have that enormous amount of cash to go and buy a house today with cash or a car today with cash. You go there hoping that you'll get a financing, you get credit. So in essence, by giving credit, we are making a life for people. We're helping people to live their lives. So if we get, we're just making a living. But when we give, we make a life. And that is amazing. And with this, I want to thank you very much for, for being with us today. And I know this is going to be transmitted later to all the member chambers and to our, our database to over 11,000 people. So I know you'll enjoy it if you are a small business, if you are a sole owner or a big business. I hope that some of these techniques that I learned over the past 40 plus years will help you to be prosperous, to increase your top line, your sales revenue, and beef up your bottom line, your, prof your profit. And if you sold on credit, your receivables will be of high quality and they will be converted into cash. And thus you can say, a sale is not a sale until the cash is in the bag. And yes, it is in the bag. So I thank you very much for being with me and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. And with that, we sign off.